go. Hello, Future Tribe. Welcome to another episode. This week, we've got Thomas Ratia from Phrase.io. How are you today, Tommy? Great. Thanks for joining Good. us. Yeah, of course. Awesome. So let's get started. Phrase.io, uh, what's it all about? Yeah, so we're building what, what we call an answer engine uh, for your website. Um, so, you know, the way I like to explain it is that, you know, when you go into a website, let's, let's think of the worst website possible that oftentimes is a, is a government website, or I like to use the government and the insurance uh, websites. You know, you go into them and you don't really go to them to like browse around or spend time on, the, on them. You really want to find something, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, what we notice is that uh, oftentimes the search on the website is not the great experience. And at least myself and most people uh, are getting used to answers on Google, right? So you're, you're kind of expecting nowadays answers. Yes. Uh, and that's what we call the answer economy, right? People are getting used to getting answers. So we kind of saw an opportunity to build a better experience for website search that is focused on answers. And we built a, you know, an answer engine. Essentially, it takes in your whole website and kind of understands it, build you know, this sort of machine learning involved in the, you know, the back end, and then allows your visitor to ask a question and, and provide an answer. Now, the big, the big difference between us and, and, and chatbots is that the chatbots today uh, usually work out of rules. You know, so you need to kind of like hardwire a tree, mm-hmm. uh, like yes. a logic tree. Right, like a sequence. And, uh, Right, like a sequence. And that's great for qualification, right? It's really good for understand, you know, getting the person's email. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it's, it's quite salesy, right? You, you go into a website and these chatbots, most people see them today as, as sales and conversion tools. Uh, on the other hand, our tool is, is, is more, is answer driven. So we first try to find the answer in your website content. You know, so your, your mm-hmm. website of content. So we thought like, all right, these chatbots, are totally disconnected from your website content. How about we try to find the answer in your content, and then, you know, as a result of the answer, add value, and and then you know, collect an email, whatever the purpose is, but trying to find, trying to deliver value with an answer That's by the using first the sort of methodology. So you ingest the content from a website. So let's say I want to install it on our website. We've thought about say installing knowledge bases before. Um, we, we just looked at sort of integrating a support ticketing system and you know, a lot of them talk about knowledge bases. This is yeah. different because instead of us coming up with you know, the question and the answer, you're sort of ingesting all the information provided already on the website and then using AI, um, to sort of intelligently deliver an answer when it's asked. Is that, is that pretty much what you're trying to do? Uh, yeah, so there's this, there's this notion of what is called uh, unest, un- unstructured content, right? This content that is sitting in your, in your landing pages, in your, blo- in, you know, in, in your SEO content, your mm-hmm. blog post, case studies, uh, FAQs as well, and, and, and help centers. That's the more traditional uh, kind of like knowledge base. But we usually take it all in. Usually we like to say we unify all the content into one place, you know, across landing pages and blog and help center. And, and we kind of like have this uh, system that turns that, you know, in the back end into a knowledge base, you know, that then is used for question answering. But that's mm-hmm. all constructed behind the scenes uh, and then allows that question answering without you having to manually kind of like, you know, hardwire everything. Yes. Yeah. And sort of it, essentially, um, the traditional systems nowadays, you know, chatbots are completely separate from the website. Yes, they're on a website, but they don't really, as far as I know, I haven't found any that go, um, you know, talk interface with the website at all or, or the content. Um, right. and then knowledge bases again, are just sort of limited to what you come up with. And yes, you can come up with content for knowledge bases based off what your customers and clients have asked you in the past, but it's still not the same approach. Um, so take me back. When did you, when did you get started on this, uh, on phrase.io and this project? Yeah. I mean, it's been quite a, quite a story because we didn't start the company with this vision. it has been, it's been quite, quite a pivot. Uh, so I started in 2017. Mm-hmm. So it's been years, two years and a half or two years. And I started actually with my with my partner working, wanting to work on how to apply AI for content in a very broad way. So we started to work on developing different techniques to really 
you know, kind of like there's this, this field of NLP that mm. people in the audience might know about. You know, it's called Natural Language Processing. That's the, the acronym NLP. And it's all about how can we teach computers to read? That's pretty much the, 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 mm. the goal goal of, of NLP is how, how can computers understand language and as a result of that, you know, deliver value in, in different contexts. And, and so when we, you say read there, um, you mean not just to sort of look at the text, but to also understand context and, and sort of assess text like a human would versus, because right, so, I, I guess the audience might be wondering, Hey, my computer can read, but that's, that's not what, it, what it's doing. It's just spurting out, you know, what it's, what is written versus yeah. understanding the full context within which, you know, a statement's used or a phrase is used in the, the context of it all. Right. So we, we like to kind of break down our, our NLP engine in, in three stages. The, the first one we built was uh, topic understanding. So that's like, you know, you analyze a, an article or, or many articles and you kind of like understand what are the main topics in each article, how they relate to each other. And that's like a, like a generalized topic understanding across uh, you know, industries and websites, right? Uh, then we also worked a lot on summarization. So that's the idea of being able to turn a long document into a shorter one. So that's, wow. that's not only reading comprehension, but it's also what is called, uh, na- that's called NLG, which is natural language generation, right? Mm-hmm. So you see, able to actually write content. So we have like, uh, we've made a lot of progress there. And then you have the final goal was question answering. That, that actually leverages both topic understanding and, and summarization because sometimes a great answer to a question is, is the summary of an article, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Uh, or, you know, we have different types of answers, but we've been focused, you know, we started a company, back to your question, we started building on, building NLP tools, uh, eventually focused on content writing at the beginning. At the beginning, we were all about content, content writing. How can we, how can we help content writers produce content faster and better. Mm-hmm. And what we realized uh, when we're doing that is that um, people are creating so much content, but uh, we started to realize that quantity wasn't really a solution. It was more about creating content than your audience actually cares about. And that got us into the SEO world and, and, and getting into SEO got us into realizing that question answering was the future of SEO because you know, uh, most of the queries today in Google return an answer of some kind. Whether mm-hmm. it's a, a feature snippet or a Wikipedia article or a, or a specific fact, uh, people are expecting answers. And then that's what eventually led us to build the answer engine. But we started being a content writing tool. Right. Wow. Very interesting. So, yeah, I mean, to, to your point, it's something I talk to um, our clients about, you know, at, at Future Theory, not not the podcast, but at Future Theory, we do, you know, websites, marketing, all that stuff. And um, it's a very clear direction, like you said, that Google is going towards. And I mean, it's Google's number one goal, right? It's to answer your questions. Um, that's, yeah. that's all the search engines there do. Was this crazy, there was this crazy a stat that you could post with your audience from a, uh, from a website that it was published about two months ago that more than half of Google queries don't create a single click. So over wow. 50% of the times, you know, the people searching on Google doesn't even click anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just looking for right. answers. Like, you know, when did phrase.io release its first product? If, it, if they can get an answer, they just, need a, they just need a year or a month and a year. They don't need to click through and read any further. And, as, so, and probably as far as Google's concerned, that's fantastic because 50% of the time, they just show you ads as much as possible. Um, right, right. So yeah, there's, it's definitely controversial in terms of attribution and, 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 yes. and, and, the, and ROI for, for marketeers too. But it's kind of inevitable. I think that uh, voice search is also growing. Exactly. And, 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 you know, the difference with voice search as well, as you, as I've, I am 100% certain you know is that often with voice search, you only get one answer back. So um, it's gone from this, you know, concept of in SEO, even two, three years ago, even now is sort of, you need to be top three. Um, it's going to, you need to be top one or just, you know, the, right. there's no point to it. Um, and I, I actually realized it yesterday. I um, was driving along, remember that I had to book uh, a Christmas dinner for my family and I did 
I just did a search um, for a restaurant um, in the area. So I didn't ask the specific name and it only gave me one result. And now the restaurant that I was looking for was the third result, um, which isn't ideal, but you know, it just goes to show it, it is trending in that direction of um, yeah, local, local SEO is, is, was kind of like the first area of SEO to be impacted by this, like mm-hmm. local, you know, like, I think that's the most typical use case with the smart speakers today. When people are asking, where can I go today? Uh, you know, what's the closest restaurant? Stuff like that. That's already totally disrupted. But now it's also uh, uh, impacting, you know, B2B services, uh, B2B tech. Uh, I mean, all kinds of pretty much every industry is going to get influenced by this. Yes. By this. So you, do you see that you guys, uh, your, your sort of service um, ends up being quite a bit of SEO or have an SEO benefit? Um, is, that, is that your angle? Um, obviously, apart from, you know, delivering really good answers, is, is, is SEO a flow-on benefit of it? Um, what what yeah. do you see as sort of the big picture there? We, we, yeah, we, so we've evolved from being a, pretty much a workflow productivity tool for writing SEO content to being a tool that allows you to uh, the thing is that without content, you cannot have answers, right? So mm-hmm. like, especially in your paradigm where the system answers using your content. So if your content is not, is not great, this, everything falls yes, apart. So good. Yes. So we, we like to say that, you know, that we have like a double story. We have an SEO angle because if you really think about your website as an answer engine mm-hmm. and you really think about your content as having to address people's questions, that's going to indirectly get you in the right track adjusting to this new trend. So that's the, that's the SEO piece, kind of like taking a question-driven strategy that gets you writing content. You know, you, need, you still need to write long-form content. So the tools we build for efficiency still apply because we help you write long articles you need to rank on page one. Yes. But now you're doing that with a question in mind, first, mm-hmm. you know, up front. And then when people arrive to your website, we have the conversion angle, which says, you know, how is your customer experience uh, you know, up to speed and helping people find what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you have no idea that many of the websites we work with are websites with a lot of content, a lot of traffic, but it's still a pretty tough user experience. And, you know, we like to work with websites that have a lot of traffic, uh, that have a lot of content, and they want to do a pretty much a self-serve experience where people can go in your website and actually find what they're looking for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you mentioned government at the start and that's a, that's a big thing. Like uh, a few days ago, I just got back, I just gone back from overseas and my driver's license had expired sort of two weeks before that. And I had to go, you know, I was the one driving that night and I had to, I just wanted to find out how much is, is the driver's license? Um, yeah. how much is it to renew? And Oh my goodness. I, I, you know, as a web designer and web developer and, you know, being in that space, I like to think that I sort of know where government's going to put these things, but I just couldn't find it. I just could not find it. It took, it actually took me going through the renewal process at the checkout to see how much it cost. Um, and you know, what you're saying is essentially I could just do a search and you would, you wouldn't add more work for government because you're, software will go in and look and trawl through and find the relevant answers and just deliver the answer to me straight away, which is, which, you know, is probably saving hours on the end of government, probably days actually. Um, and you know, minutes in terms of the the customer and at the end of the day, things like government insurance, I mean, most businesses and most government organizations are there to set serve the people. So it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Now let's go back to you. Um, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? How old were you when you started Phrase.io? Uh, yeah, well, I'm 30 now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I was, I guess, 28 when I started. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I'm from Spain. Uh, I've been in Boston for 10 years now. Okay, so uh, why did you move to Boston? Did you move to Boston for work or was it no, just... No, no, I moved, moved? To Boston to I moved to Boston to finish my, my undergrad. Uh, so I studied the uh, business and then I worked in finance for a little bit. Um, hmm. but then after that, doing work- software, like coding no, engineering, in- no, no, I, yeah, I'm pretty weird. <laughs> I have a very strange story. So I, I was in business, I studied business, mm-hmm. uh, here at Northeastern university. Then 
I went to work in a bank for a year, but that was a hardcore financial, you know, Excel every day. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't very happy there. And then I had a crazy shift and I went into a master's in public health. Mm -hmm. uh, because I was very interested in uh, energy and transportation in particular. And there was this program here in, at Harvard in, in Boston uh, that was kind of like uh, fairly scientific, but more on the environmental economic side of things. So that was mm. very interested in. I wanted to work uh, in, in sustainability that I think now is a huge topic again. Uh, you know, climate change and it's, it's a real issue. And, mm -hmm. and I was for two years studying that deeply. And then when I was, uh, before finishing that master's, I got into tech. I, I learned to, I learned to code and I started a company when I, when I was a student, that was my first startup. Uh, and what did that do? Huh? What did the, what did that startup do? That the startup is actually, was actually kind of the seed idea for what phrase is today or in a way it was a CMS for academics. So I was trying to help academics publish uh, to the public, uh, mm -hmm. what is called open access publishing. Uh, I was really into research and the whole academic community and I kind of saw an opportunity there. But eventually after about two years, the company closed because it was so, it was very slow. It was mm -hmm. a very tough market to, to yeah, I mean, academics is, is one of those markets where, you know, everyone's being squeezed. If, if, if there, if you look at all, all the markets out there, but probably academics is one where, you know, n not a lot of money, not a lot of money to spend. Everyone's yeah. sort of, you know, trying to get as, as much work out of as little money and little time as they have. So yeah. when let's, let's talk about that for a minute. When, when did you, so you started that and two years later you sort of shut it down. Yeah often it's very difficult to say, you know, to tell yourself, okay, this is just not working. Let's, let's stop. How did you, right. how did you do that? Did you, did you, you know, come up with a bet with a better idea or did you come up with something that you were more passionate about and decided to just completely shutter it? Because I, I don't see why you wouldn't have just, you know, you could have just said, Oh, I'll just leave it there. You know, I'll leave a website up and do all that. It doesn't cost much to do. And if we get a client, we get a client. If we don't, we don't, we just leave right. it. But, what, what, how did you come to that decision? Well, it was, yeah, it was tough and I should have closed it, uh, even faster, but, uh, you know, for, a, yeah, for about a year, it was clear that it wasn't going to go anywhere, mm -hmm. but I was emotionally att attached to it. So I didn't want to close it. Uh, I don't know. The reasons I eventually officially closed it were several. I mean, one was a financial reason. I mean, I, I, I actually raised a little bit of money from some individuals but eventually run out of money mm -hmm. so i couldn't even, i couldn't pay the, the couple developers i had so that was the reason one didn't really have uh, people anymore that i could pay uh reason two is that kind of like acknowledging that the market was just not i mean i couldn't really figure out how to how to market it mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. how to make it not, not to mention the, the actual business model that wasn't clear either but uh, you know, figuring out how to get your your target audience attention uh, is uh, you know is very tough. I mean, that's what that's what I feel very lucky about today with this new product, which is that somehow organically we have you know dozens of signups every day, every day organically. That's kind mm -hmm. of like the first time wow, that that's amazing because some people you know the phrase is a story just comparing. I don't even read, I mean, for a long time, I didn't even know what I was doing with phrase, mm -hmm. but I knew there was demand for AI, AI powered content, content, every, you know, content marketing is, is there is a global market with people willing to pay for tools. But you know, the, the, the previous story was, wasn't that clear at all. It was very hard to get people just to try it and uh, not to mention to pay for it. So I don't know. It was a, it was a, different reasons that made me eventually close it down, but it definitely took longer because I didn't want to close it. But yes, yes. Because I, I think sometimes, especially with more entrepreneurial people when they're optimistic as well, uh, it's, it's hard sometimes to differentiate the difference between something that's not working and something that you just need to work harder at and, you know, just need that lucky break. But, um, 
it sounds like it was the it was the right decision for you to sort of go no, let's shutter it and let's let's start on this new project. So 2017, you started Phrase.io. What did it look like when you started it? Was it yourself by yourself or was it, you know, did you straight off the bat hire a bunch of developers? Did you get some funding? What did that look like? How did, how did that road begin? Right. Um, no, it was, um, I started with a friend. I started with a friend from college. Uh, between that other company and this one, I actually had another, another services company for a, for a few years. Uh, but the but phrase started. Um, I was able to convince a, a very talented friend uh, who was a data scientist, and I was also able to to convince a few investors. And we, you know, move. We started full time working on phrase. Uh, yeah, so definitely, you know, um, I was kind of the business guy, although I'm also a technical person in terms of programming and stuff, mm-hmm. but he was definitely the CTO and the, and the technical side of the company. Mm-hmm. So we started uh, just him and I, then we eventually hired another engineer, and now we're only f- uh, we're only four people right now. We're very okay. small. Wow, four people. Uh, we're, definitely, we're definitely growing, and we're about to, to raise more money and keep growing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the backbone of the company is just the few people that we are now, and now we're pretty much about to start growing significantly, but yeah. Still- so you're a, you're a software as a service business, solely software as a service. Nothing, no, no sort of additional services on the side. Um, no, no, no. This is big, yeah, this is definitely a, a self serve SaaS product. You know, mm. people people go in right now into it. In the product has two tiers, actually three tiers. There is the the basic individual plan, which is just twenty five bucks a month. That's actually about to increase. Some mm. people, some people. So we, we've been very aggressive with pricing. We are like 10 times cheaper than our competitor. We're very cheap. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that we want to use these content creation tools to get people in. And then the answer engine is the premium tool. So we can right. pull out this panel. And it's also kind of a freemium model where people can go in, try for free, and they can still come back with some limited usage, but they can still, still come back and use it. So it's kind of a premium um, process mm. and then you pay whenever you're ready to pay. So how are you doing this in terms of the financial side? Do you have investors on board and that that's what's working? Obviously you'd be generating revenue through the business itself, but I'm going to guess that there's a bit of a difference between your expenses at the moment and, and your revenue coming in. Um, so you have investors. Yeah. Is that, is that how you're doing it? Yeah, we have, yeah, at this point we have, uh, yeah, we have venture capital in the mm. company. Uh, yeah, it's certainly, you know, when you get big, when you get busy money, I mean, profitability is, is the enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be, I want to be, I want to be able to expand on growth. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's what it is all about. I need to be able to say, all right, if I get a million dollars extra of spend, uh, how much can I grow? That's yeah, that's really yeah. yeah. And and I like to call that intentional point. growth as well. It's intentional growth that you know a lot of people I think get especially smaller businesses, um, not necessarily SaaS, because by the time you get to SaaS, you, you've got a different, you have to have a different mentality, but say smaller businesses, um, local businesses, they often go, you know, there's no marketing budget. We can't spend money on marketing. Um, I'm sure you've heard that before, you know, where they're doing say, um, 250 K a year. So not, not massive money. Uh, but uh, you know, what you're saying is when you get money like that, you need to be, have a very intentional action plan to say, when someone, you know, knocks and taps on your shoulder and goes, Tommy, I've got a million bucks. What can you do with it? You need to be able to say, this is what I can do. And this is what I can generate in terms of traffic and added revenue and added business. Um, so it sounds like you've gotten to a stage where you're, you're pretty confident in that approach or are you still sort of growing more organically? We're still growing organically and, and organic growth is, is fine. Now organic growth also requires investment, right? Because mm-hmm. if you're going through through SEO, you need to invest in in content. You know that. So it's not when people say organic. Sometimes it sounds like it's t- it's free. Free, it's, it's yes. Uh, because there is someone behind these things, building a strategy and creating content. But it's certainly very cost effective. Uh, but yeah, I mean, right now we are approaching a, a hundred customers and and really figuring out why people pay and what, and, and the use case and the personas and, and, you know, and now we're now experimenting with a little bit of paid acquisition, you know, mm-hmm. on, on mm-hmm. 
on, AdWords. On, on so okay on adwords is that sort of your number we started with adwords because mm -hmm. i think social will definitely be interesting but we will start with adwords just because you know there are certain queries that are highly intentional and i think there is potential there but uh, have you looked at places like LinkedIn where, you know, you would arguably find the pro find professionals? I know it's not cheap for advertising, but do you have like a LinkedIn presence that you intentionally sort of push for client acquisition, things like that? Or yeah, not, I mean, not that's, really? that's in my, yeah, that's definitely my to-do list to ramp up LinkedIn. It's, it's, it's traditionally worked pretty well for me and I, I have a pretty solid network on LinkedIn. I don't think I'm using it as much as I could. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely there, uh, ready to be ready to be used for sure. I mean, it's uh, just before this call, I actually met someone on LinkedIn. I booked a call for tomorrow, which is you know my my convert. You know, so it's definitely a, a really cool channel. I think right now it's all about experimenting with channels. I mean, right now a very promising channel for the answer engine is our agency model. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we're building this network of marketing agencies that you know, can install the answer engine on, on their clients' websites and then provide the service to maintain it and create content for it. And it's kind of a new service for them. So that's, you know, that's an, another channel in addition to organic. We're trying to figure out what what role can agencies play. Uh, yeah. Hey, that's something that we, we can chat about as well, because that's the first thing that, you know, I thought of when I, when I saw it, we, we haven't gone into the government market yet, but you know, from again, talking from a not podcast, but business sort of yeah. point of view, um, yeah. where's probably next three months, we're going to hop onto government panels locally in Australia. And, um, like I said, you know, wait, massive that, potential. To clarify, the government, I, uh, I don't even, just to remember, we're actually not working with government. I just like, that's just an example that makes it very obvious to understand. No, no. I, I, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, you're sort of a government service or you work with government. Okay. I, I guess I, it's, it's probably the, one of the best use cases. I, I think, think it's very obvious to understand the problem. Exactly. Right? And there's so much content and, and, you know, insurance is good. All these big, really, really big businesses are really good sources of just massive amounts of content. I mean, you go on people like on, on websites, like the other day I was on the website of BHP, the, the oil gas yep. mining company. And, you know, again, they've got they've just, just their main menu. You scroll through and they've got something like probably 40, 50 different, different yep. pages that you can go to. Um, so yeah, I could bring a government, but it, it's sort of, uh, I guess, um, to give you context, context as well, based in Canberra, Canberra is sort of exists because of government. Uh, because we have the federal government here. Most people think that Sydney is sort of the capital of, of Australia, but Canberra is actually the capital. So we, we have a lot of public servants. So government is, I would say, you know, 50% of sort of what runs Canberra. So it's a, it's a very good, very relevant example for, from my angle, from my point of view, um, which is why, yeah, I, I keep bringing it up. But yes, to make it clear, you guys don't just work with government. It's a right, right, right. service for any website. It's an and yeah, as a of websites. A lot of the websites we're either work, working with or piloting are actually, many of them are, are B2B tech SaaS companies that are trying to mm -hmm. improve the customer experience. You know, there is, um, you know, there is the, honestly, any website that has significant traffic uh, and a lot of content and that wants to pursue a self-serve experience is going to need to help their visitors find whatever it is that, that they're looking for. Yeah. Whether it's yeah. the, whether it's in the research stage or in the customer service stage, uh, it's kind of the same. De definitely. So d does your product then uh, have a chat sort of component to it? Or when, when I search for an answer and I get an answer, what do you, do you guys let me then action, like take a next step, like send an email or start live chat or how do, what does that look like? How does that work? Yeah. So, so, so we're actually trying to find markets where people want, are actually escaping from live chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's one segment we're very interested in because that's the segment where, for example, let's say you're a website with 3 million visitors a month. You know, you, live chat is uh, extremely expensive to maintain, both mm -hmm. in terms of software license and people maintaining it. So I'm actually, I'm actually interested in websites trying to run away from live chat. Now, for websites that see the tool as a, as a conversion tool, uh, they would uh, we integrate with CRM. So we have an email kind of like, uh, we, you can trigger email capture the mm -hmm. system and we also integrate with a few live chats so you can actually transfer to a human in certain situations right yes yes and and that's i guess going to 
And that's just accepting that the market is a certain way at the moment. <clears throat> that's why you're integrating with live chat, but you know, moving forward, you're probably, and, and it makes sense. Um, like you said, 3 million million visitors a month. And even if 10% of them had, or even if 1% of them had questions that yeah. that's, that's still expensive to maintain. Yeah, we're, um, seeing, we're seeing about 3% of visitors asking questions in average across websites, which is a number that you don't really hear from many chatbot companies talk about how many people engage with the chatbot. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a number. If you look around on, the, on Google, you won't find a lot about that. Uh, it, it was a number I always wanted to know. That's why I'm bringing it up. And I, um, in average, my customers, uh, it's about 3% of visitors engage the system. Mm -hmm. So there are two, there, there's really two situations. There is the companies that that need to stay away from live chat because they are too big, especially for public facing uh, pages. Yes. You know, in product pages, a different story that you, you need live chat inside the product because that's customer yeah, yeah. service. Yeah, that's just customer service. But yeah, government or schools and colleges, things like that, where they don't necessarily have a huge chunk of money to put personnel to answer questions. Need to and then there's, the people who, then there's the people who don't want to stuff a live chat. Uh, we actually have a pretty interesting use case with a law firm in New Zealand, actually. Okay. Uh, it's an immigration law firm that they, they've become one of the highest traffic websites in New Zealand for all things immigration. But these, these wow. people are they're lawyers and they don't want to be sitting in front of the computer answering, you know, in the live chat. Mm. Uh, and they don't want to build a marketing team either. But they have an agency that is cranking out content that drives traffic uh, and it's a resource. It's almost like a public service. Yes. Uh, so that's another kind of type of segment I like because these people don't really want live chat, but they have content and they want to add value to their users. Yeah, definitely. So let's, let's uh, switch gears a bit to um, maybe some of the, you know, some of the mistakes that you've made along the way. Uh, let's talk about phrase.io specifically. Um, any, any, you know, big things that you've done that, um, you would, you would, you know, tell the audience, Hey, look out for this. Um, I, I'm not saying in terms of regrets, it's more of a, don't, you know, don't think this or don't, don't take this angle. Anything that comes to mind? Uh, well, uh, yeah, probably many things. I mean, one of the things is, uh, you know, building, we've built an, in, an insane amount of things and features, uh, totally out, out of my own imagination. <laughs> you know, the, the amount of it, the, the amount of product it, you know, the, the only reason why we are still alive is because we've, we were able to do it very fast, kind mm -hmm. of like extremely fast iterations. But at the same time, uh, if I could go back, I would definitely validate a lot more before building, you know, talking to customers a lot more. Uh, sometimes what happens is that you find a customer that really likes something that you're building and you, and you assume that everybody else is also going to want it, but then you go to a second one and they want something else and a third one and they want something else. And you end up with an amalgamation of features. Uh, so that was, a, that was a big, you know, that was definitely something we, we, we did for a while. Yeah. Eventually we started to see repetition of the features and that mm. was when got a little bit normal. But overbuilding was definitely a, a, a mistake. Um, I think that you know, thinking of uh, thinking of um, kind of like what they what is kind of like the story of the problem. You know, like you're solving a problem, right? But thinking about how to tell the story of that problem, uh, and and that being way more important than your product. You know, that's something that. I really just learn over time, you know, now when I, when I go into a demo call, right. We call like a, like a sales call, right. Or like yes. Now people call it a, an expiration call to make it more friendly, but it's really, <laughs> a sales, it's really, you know, yes, it's a sales yes. you're, you're trying to convince them to buy your product. Yeah. Uh, now <laughs> what I do now is that I actually start with the story of the problem. It's, it's totally, you know, I, I, I don't even show the product until they, they are buying that problem. Yes. Because like when you start, when you, I used to be, you know, I'm a product person and I used to go straight up into the details of the product, all these million features that we had, when in reality, I, I had no idea whether they even had the problem. I thought they Right. Did. Yes. Because you started explaining the product. It's sort of like saying, you know, this is a Ferrari. It's a really, really fast car. 
without realizing that the person shopping for the vehicle has six kids right. and, and a dog and right. they're not going to buy two, two car, uh, two, two car, uh, set a sports car, no matter, you know, how cheap you're going to sell it for. Um, so sort of taking that approach of let's give them the story about, you know, why this, this, uh, minivan, um, is, is really comfortable, really luxurious and, and yep. sell them on the story. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, we I believe that every business is there to solve a problem and serve a customer. Um, right. so every business has a story, no matter what you do, what you sell, um, whether right. it's software, whether it's cosmetics, um, at the end of the day, you're solving a problem for them, you know? Um, and, and that's a very good point of sort of not getting, um, not getting too lost in it and understanding the customer in, in the picture because the customer wants to see themselves using your product. Um, yeah. but at the end of the day, they don't have, there's no reason for them to, they're not incentivized to come into the call wanting to buy your product. That's not, they, 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 they will come into the call not wanting to buy a product because that's right. going to cost them money, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. So that was definitely, uh, that was probably the biggest learning, uh, you know, the, the power of that story. Uh, and, um, I think that now what I'm thinking of now, the next time, the next type of challenge is uh, thinking more about culture and growth because we're now, now you're dealing with building a team that, that and, and that goes with another set of challenges I'm able to face. But up until now, I think it's been, you know, building too much stuff without, well, without any kind of evidence and focusing too much on the product without telling that story first. Focusing on the customer. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a good segue into my next sort of question about what you plan to do moving forward. So you're a team of four at the moment. Um, yeah. and are those four people in an office over there? Or are they some of them remote or uh, what does that look like? Uh, right now it's, it's all here in Boston. I mean, mm-hmm. this is truly the, the kind of the backbone of the team. You know, it's uh, two engineers, myself and a, and a girl and a, uh, kind of like a growth person. Mm-hmm. Uh, now we're about to hire, uh, we have two immediate hires coming up, probably starting January, which is marketing and sales, you know, one mm-hmm. marketer, one hardcore sales guy. And then next year, so that's happening right away. And then we will kind of take it from there based on how things are going, but we're definitely looking at, at the very least doubling the team by next year. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, the reason I asked that is because I, uh, even in my business is going through sort of a similar thing. We've just had someone sort of for the next month and a half, they can't, they can't, uh, turn up to work essentially just due to some other, other issues on their end. Um, and, um, you know, trying, I'm, I'm going through that process of trying to think about, you know, do you get remote people or do you get remote people to do sort of project-based work or do you get people in and then how do you build that culture and what, what are you, you know, trying to build it towards? Because, um, obviously that culture has to reflect where your business is heading and where you want the business to head as well. And, um, no. I'd imagine, you know, having people there, I, I personally like it. We've got people who a lot of our staff come in, um, yeah. but then on the flip side, I guess there's the benefits of remote and a lot of people are heading towards that remote, uh, direction. Yeah. Of, you know, yeah. just do work uh, also, uh, my, my people don't come to us every day. I mm. mean, one of them comes once a week. Uh, actually my partner comes once a week, mm. uh, for different reasons. And it's fine. I mean, we're in constant communication anyways, you know, we're on a Slack every day or on the phone. It's, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, emails you're connect you're connected and if there's an issue pop up the fact that you're geographically in different locations doesn't actually make a yeah. huge difference but don't you feel like there's an issue or it creates it makes uh, adds a bit of friction to culture and creating culture oh of course no, no, it's definitely i think that uh you know i think that for someone to be a remote worker they definitely need excellent communication skills and, and they need to be, you know, very responsible because otherwise it's very easy to, to be really loose and, 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 and really lose touch. And not the, uh, in addition to culture, which for sure is, is important also really understanding the business and what you guys are doing because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm, for example, I'm talking to customers every single day, you know, if an engineer doesn't talk to a customer or even knows what the customers are saying for months, that's a problem, right? Because they kind of lose context of why, why they're doing what they're doing. So yeah. I think that uh, it's culture, it's proximity to customers, 
understanding their problems and you know and all of that kind of builds culture so yeah it's a tricky question i mean uh, i'm the ceo and i mean i wish everyone was here every single day to be honest that would yeah. be my preference but at the mm -hmm. same time you need to understand that uh there is a trade-off and i think there is a healthy balance in between yeah, between between it all. Um, one last question about moving forward. So you're looking to hopefully double the team by say next uh, this time next year. Um, and what does your trip, you know, journey to profitability look like? Is that is that a far goal? Is it a is it a shorter shorter goal? Um, and how do you think about reaching profitability um, in the in the grand scheme of things? Yeah. So I mean, so my goal right now is kind of the playbook in in a startup kind of VC backed startup. So what I'm about to say is not just really applies to me, but I think it's the typical flavor you want to pursue. So right now, you know, so we're about to close another seed round, right? Like another seed funding round. And now the next step is really how do you get to the to the series A? Uh, mm -hmm. which is typically now here in Boston you you you're kind of like you kind of qualify for a series A. Of course this depends case by case, but yes. typically you want to be somewhere close to a million dollars in revenue to start Series A conversations. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the context of SaaS, you need to be, you know, anywhere between 70 to $100,000 a month of like recurrent monthly revenue. revenue. Yeah. So the question is, how, how much do we need to spend to get there? You know, uh, so, so right now we're in the process of like building out a plan to get that, to that next milestone. Mm -hmm. uh, at that milestone, though, you don't really want to be profitable. You want to show that you want to show that you can imb you can grow even more. You yes. know, because now there is a million dollars coming up. But how do you then take the company from a million dollars to five million, ten million dollars? So it's this constant kind of like uh, kind of like pursuit of growth that, yeah. that you're going after because in in the startup. Now, if, if you want to build a business and be profitable, that's that's totally fine. But that's just not what a startup is. Yeah, it's it's funny because that that, that VC world has led to this, um, and like you said, and I've never never actually thought about it that way. And I don't think I've heard anyone say say it, but it, it's what it is. Is that profitability really isn't the goal because because being profitable means that you could have spent more money and grown more. Um, and that's I mean, essentially what I mean, you're saying. It's important right? in the sense that the financial model is a scalable yes. to the extent that one day at what you know, depending on your market size, right? I think yes, that's a big right. thing. Once you market get the mass mm -hmm. like let's think of a company like Uber, right? Uber probably didn't want to be profitable quickly because they realize there is a massive global opportunity for this. If we keep growing fast, we can one day be a, I don't even know what's the valuation, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So I think there's a lot of factors in place and, and you know, there is a perfect chance that a startup reaches a, a point where they reach, I don't know, $20 million in revenue and they've kind of reached a peak and, and they struggle. Mm -hmm. And at that point is where you either stay like that and, then, and that's where profitability becomes yeah, crucial, important. right? Yes, because you've you've sort of reached your maximum market saturation, and then then you're stuck there with a company that's losing money, and then that that's where it doesn't make any sense. I, I get right. what you mean. So while you're that growing, point, you have to either think of profitability or sell the company. I mean, there are different avenues, right? But, yes, yes. But definitely yes. during the first three years, three to five years of the startup, profitability, uh, I don't think is that crucial compared to the ability to show that you can grow. Mm -hmm. It's a growth potential and model, right? Yeah. 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 No, love it. Love it. Awesome. And, um, I, 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 I lied to you. I have one more question about sort of moving forward. Do you guys have any, any iterations or extra things coming up that you're really excited about? Um, or, or is the plan to really try and, um, continue to improve the product? Um, incremental yeah. sort of improvements and get more people on board and get more customers. Well, we're definitely at a point where, like I said, we've built a lot of product. We've, uh, we've been a such a product centric company for a long time. I'm honestly right now really focused on, 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 on nailing down the sales process, figuring out this partnership program. Uh, I, I truly think that this idea of uh, answer engine, what we call AEO, I actually didn't mention this before, but we, we mm -hmm. see the feature SEO being answer engine optimization, 
we pretty much see it as a new line of service for agencies. You know, we, we truly think that it's a service that, that is ideal for an agency to deliver. And um, we're trying to grow that way. So I think that I'm definitely focused on the business side of it now. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed about, about uh, you know, uh, breaking even, but definitely obsessed about figuring out exactly why people want this, how much they want to pay, and how to grow it. So, I mean, that said, the product is very exciting because I think it's a very exciting technology and uh, always always trying to innovate more on the, on the science part of it. So mm -hmm. that part is always going to be there. Yes. Uh, but, but it sounds like your products, you know, at a stage where you're, re you're pretty happy with it. And now it's just a matter of working out the business around it to sell it and to, to, you know, yeah. uh, you know, correct right fit market fit uh pricing things like that that's that's sort of um a more of a focus because your product um, is, is, is in a yeah. good place and a huge focus on on content and education i mean uh, mm -hmm. being able to right now for example now we're, we're about to launch a, a a bunch of videos that we didn't have we didn't have a single video of the product or anything so wow all these things now that are pretty much all these foundational things that you don't get to do when you're so busy with the product. Now it's time to get your marketing materials, your onboarding processes, all these other stuff that were not even a topic six months ago. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to sign up and see how it all looks and right. um, I'll let you, let you know what I think. Uh, where can people find out more about uh, phrase.io? Well, it's just phrase.io. That's you know, the phrase with an S, F-R-A-S-E.io. We'll include the link in the description. An, and an S. So it's, it's phrase, which in Spain mean, Spanish means sentence. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. uh, so phrase, F-R-A-S-E.io. And the homepage uh, is what I ask you to sign up for free. Like I mm -hmm. said, free to sign up. And how long is, it? is a trial, is it? Well, no, it's a freemium. So it's actually a freemium. So it's okay. actually... Uh, free forever, of course, with a bunch of tricks to get to hook you. To <laughs> get you, get you yeah, I mean, that's the mission but, to get you hooked and get you addicted. And then obviously yeah. if it's, if it's useful for the client, then the client should have to pay for it. So that makes it's sense. Very affordable. I mean, it's a very affordable product. It starts at 25 bucks a month. We're actually going to be raising prices in January, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Still want to be an afford very affordable product. Uh, so yeah, encourage you to check it out and just check it out for yourself. There's no, uh, it's totally self-serve, so you can try. There's it. nothing to lose. Um, well, awesome. We've got to the part, uh, which I would say is my favorite part, which is the top 12. Um, I've, are you ready for this? The top, top 12, uh, I've got a bunch of questions to throw at you and, uh, we'll get the ball rolling if you're ready. Sure. Awesome. So top three books or podcasts that you recommend, do you read much, uh, in terms of books or do you listen to many podcasts? Um, well, I'm actually not reading as many books as I would like to, to be honest right now. I am definitely, these couple of years have been totally crazy. Uh, but I'm definitely following certain, uh, you know, podcasts. Um, you know, there is a company here in Boston that there is a few, I guess a lot of girls related things that I'm following. Mm -hmm. For example, there is a company here in Boston I like a lot called AppQs. Um, AppQs is a company that does a lot of, um, they've kind of built this, this, uh, idea of the growth, the product led growth. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. So like, do you have a uh, podcast about it or? Well, they have a really active blog and they do all kinds of stuff that is always pretty, pretty good stuff that matters to me right now because mm -hmm. it's all about user onboarding, user tutorials, uh, and product growth in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's one company I would recommend. And community kind of business oriented because that's what we talked yeah, about. That's fine. Uh, and then of course, there's co another company in Boston that uh, is kind of in the same space as me called Drift. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe you know, I've heard of Drift, yeah. So Drift, uh, these guys are doing content like crazy. Uh, and they do have a podcast. It's a very mm -hmm. good podcast called uh, Seeking Wisdom that they recommend uh, where the CEO and the marketing guy get together and, and, and talk about honestly, marketing and life as a whole, mm -hmm. but very much similar to AppQ is talking a lot, a lot about growth and talking about marketing. And, uh, I don't know when you're in, in this mindset, in this kind of growth mindset, I think it's, it's nice to hear what others are doing. And these guys definitely, are definitely and you learn, learn from them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any, any other, any other books or podcasts that you would, that you've um, read, listened to over the, 
over the years that come to mind? I don't know. Those are two that came to mind immediately. Um, yeah, no, that, that's all good. We can move on to the next one. So top three software or tools that you can't live without. I imagine as a SaaS product, you guys have a lot of software on the back end. you know, daily planning stuff, right. um, bug, bug tracking, um, all that stuff. What, what's the top three you would say that you use daily? So I use, uh, I use Trello. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I use Trello for, um, you know, for task management. I use uh, well. I use GitHub for mm-hmm. for code management. <laughs> uh, honestly, we, we use Slack before as well. We use, of course, uh, and Slack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have it here. Yeah, uh, Slack. Those would be your top three. You would say maybe your top three. Those pro- of course, you have Gmail that you, you mm-hmm. need. <laughs> Anything that we haven't heard about or we wouldn't have heard about that that you use? Um, let's see. Well, I use Phrase. <laughs> of course, <laughs> uh, but I use AppQs for for product stuff. So all of all of our onboarding tutorials and tool tips, stuff like that is is AppQs. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. We use Drift for that's awesome. chat in the product. Yeah. Um, no. That's it. I'm actually not such a huge innovator in terms of tools. I mean, there's so many things <laughs> that I that I that I manage for the whole company that. It's just uh, a lot. Honestly, it's a bit overwhelming, the amount of tools that we use. I mean, yeah. No, it, it, it makes sense. I mean, you, you've sort of listed the best at what they do um, for the different, for the relevant, you know, services anyway. So um, yeah. that makes total sense. And I guess you're in a position where you don't, you can't really be trying these new, new things that are coming up because that's not your focus at the moment. You, you're sort yeah. of trying to grow your own business. So um, it, it, it makes when you have to pay, when you have to pay for all these tools you kind of like you know become more critical about what to use i guess yes uh while engineers are of course testing all kinds of toys and things i'm I'm a lot more practical when it comes to tools and if it works you just pay for it and and you know there's the value there so um next one top three mantras you try and live by anything you tell yourself when you know things are down or anything you you sort of repeat to yourself or try and live by mentors um, mantras. So, oh, you know, mantras. yeah. Um, well, I like to, f- I like to feel like, um, I don't know. I like, I kind of like to lead by, I guess, by example, you know, that's, uh, I'm the type of person that might not be, I mean, I think I'm definitely a workaholic. I work, I work way too much and everybody tells me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I think I like to, I think that causes an impact on the people around me. And I think that I'm pretty sure that the people I work with, uh, you know, see me working very hard and, and, and I think that, I mean, the way I see that is that I try to lead by example in, in a way that I like to work with very independent people that you know hopefully i don't need to be on top of them mm. and inspired by the fact that this guy is is doing everything i can to make this happen so yeah. i think that's yeah like um you know i definitely one value in the company is that you know a commitment to to diversity and and being open to cultures is is something i'm kind of an activist about mm. i've been an activist, kind of, I mean, an activist. I've been supporting a lot of stuff, for example, related to immigration in the U.S. I mean, I mean, I'm an immigrant myself, and it wasn't easy at all to to be where I am today from an immigration perspective. And now, uh, one of one of our colleagues is also also you know not Amer- not American, but we're both kind of making it here. So I think that's something. Yeah, that, no, that, I, I love it. Lead by example, uh, make an impact with the people around you, and um, trying to support uh, diversity and, and cultures as much as possible. They're, they're very yep. three fantastic three things to live by. And the last one, uh, we sort of covered this before, but a- anyone you follow or study and, and why you follow them and, and study them? Any CEOs, marketers, anyone uh, interesting? Well, yeah, I mean, well, of course, Steve Jobs is one that mm. is kind of always there. <laughs> um for reasons that people already know him, so I don't think we need to go into why. Um, I've personally always been a huge fan of uh, Ed Williams. Ed Williams is the, he was the founder of Twitter, and okay. he was the 
blogger before Twitter and then founder of Twitter. He's the founder of Medium. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ed Williams is pretty much the father of of uh, kind of like content systems yeah. you know, on the internet. So I've traditionally for a long time I've been following him and I think he's a very a very thought, thought, thoughtful person that you know that I like. Um, like I mentioned, this company Drift in Boston has uh, has some really cool people leading the company. Uh, the founder of the founder of Drift, David Cancel, uh, he's definitely inspiration. Uh, this is his fifth company, so wow. uh, he's learned a lot about the journey and and um, he's definitely someone I follow. Um, I don't know, and then I have a few more like maybe not well known people, uh, but. You know the, the role of mentors. I think is very important to you. you yes, know, people, you might not know them; they're not famous, but no. uh, developing mentors locally. I think that's uh, you know pretty important very for important me as well. Yeah, awesome. No, love it. Well, um, that that just about wraps up this this episode, Tommy. Thanks for hopping on board, uh, Thomas Ratia from Phrase.io. I, I will include all the links to everything that we've talked about um, and links to all the people that we've talked about um, in the description as, as usual. Um, thanks for, thanks for joining. Of course. Thanks for having me.